This is Jane Lowe and I'm at Cloud Expo Asia here at Marina Bay Sands in uh, Singapore. And I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Wong Wai Ming, who is the CEO of Capital Data Center, as well as the chair of SG Tech with me today to talk about digital transformation, AI, and the impact on data centers and also the sustainability concerns that people have about data centers. So thank you so much for your time today. It's my pleasure, Jane. Yeah, Thanks so, for having me. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, so when we look at the data centers, right, and, uh, and looking back in over the last two decades, right, uh, we're talking about the Ethernet era and then obviously there's the social media era and then we move into now the AI era and then mm. earlier in your talk you talk about Web3 and immersive technologies, right? So these have all sort of a different sort of mm. demands on data centers. Mm. And so over these last two decades, how has customers and users and enterprise customers look at um, what they are looking for in terms of data center? I'm thinking, you know, there's some aspects that remain unchanged in mm. terms of expectations. Mm. You expect that it's going to have certain latency, um, sort of performance, mm. certain processing power, certain storage capabilities. So what has changed and what remains constant? Mm. Well, I would say the concept of what we are seeing today, if you say two decades versus now, is the same, right? If you look at the iPhone, if you remember iPhone version 1 with a single button, that was Macintosh, right? Steve Jobs was pushing for it, just say it was on a desktop. Now we have the technology to bring it into a small little handheld device. And if you are talking about network is the computer, that was Scott Manili's pitch at Sun Microsystem. So that vision of what we are happening today in technology, everything as a service, everything on the network, was during dot-com. But unfortunately, technology, the visionaries were before their time. Technology wasn't ready, network wasn't as pervasive, cost was high to connect, so to use a service over a net, you have performance issue service, and it just couldn't work because of technology. Imagine carrying around a Macintosh and super this, slow exactly connection. Right, yeah. Now you are doing that, right? Yeah, right but right, you, yeah, you can't yeah. feel it because of technology, but I think the most uh, uh, so-called disruptive change to watch out for is connectivity. Connectivity actually changed mm. how we consume technology today. So all this Web3 distributed that's right, that's right. is possible, you know, GPUs, cloud computing yeah. is possible, we seamlessly don't feel the difference, yeah, yeah. it's because of connectivity. But of course, technology of the mobile devices and shrinking form factor also brought probably a supercomputer onto our hands. Uh, that's that's, that's so right. All this combination of technology, evolution has made a change. Yeah. yeah, but in the background, obviously, there's also um, the, the, the data centers have transformed over the years, right? Oh, to yes. respond to the, all these uh, <laughs> different requirements, right? Absolutely, yeah, right. So the whole concept was there, but just that uh, in the past, there wasn't such consolidated use of a service or software ah, as a I service, see, see infrastructure okay, as a right. service because of all the okay. challenges of technology. Right. But today, because it becomes possible with technology, That's suddenly right. cloud becomes possible, becomes viable, I becomes see. real. Right? right. So instead of enterprises building their own data center in the past, just to run their own application, exactly. now they can actually move a lot of things to the cloud. Yeah. Right? and being centralized. That's why you're you are seeing bigger and bigger data centers uh, in a sense. That's yes. right, that's right. That's, so if you ask me about the real end user, they, have, they do not see the data centers. No, we don't. It's yes. transparent and invisible to them. Now, if you move one more layer upstream on users, uh, then it's the application service provider, the infrastructure providers, and the big tech companies, yes. we call them hyperscalers, right? They provide cloud services to enterprises, to end users, to applications, right? So what do they look for depending, it's really depending on the application workload that they want to run. Right? And they need a combination. So for example, to really host the real compute and workload and the storage workload for let's say enterprise or, or anything like social media, uh, these are the big core data centers. They will probably need a location that's well connected, but doesn't need to have the latency and proximity so close to the user, but good enough to deliver that. And sufficient amount of energy and power right, right, okay. from the grid to support their, what well, I will say, their core load. Right? Right, okay. Then, to complement that, you need the edge. Right? This is where you push services closer to the edge, where the user experience is important, where latency is important, uh, and that is the, the different type of data center. They are not so big in requirement, not so hungry on power, but then connectivity becomes key. 
to them. So if you look at, for example, Netflix, how is it delivered to our home is that the core storage actually pushes to content delivery networks to the edge. That's why in our experience, and you click, your movie comes down very quickly. It doesn't come all the way from US. It's actually cash in between, intermittent, and the, and the edge to deliver to us. How is AI changing that sort of, uh, you know, requirements? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a favorite topic for many people. Yeah, it's like after ChatGPT, the whole world is so aware of AI. So AI is already here before even chat GPT. The technology of large language model is actually existing. I mean, you look at it this way, right? Suddenly after chat GPT, how is it possible that all these tech giants from the Americans, the Chinese, the big and the small, are launching all these large language model and generative AI? Because the technology all about is there. Why you don't see it is because everyone is holding back because these are big investments, right? They are not certain and unsure. What is the market uptake going to be? But then, ChatGPT has given, in a way, a market test and survey, free of charge for everyone. And when everyone realized that the adoption is going to be massive, so there's a rush in investment to deploy yep. the AI workload, right? That's right? To try to capture the market in generative oh. AI. But all this while, AI has been applied in many, many circumstances that we don't see. It's actually existing in our day-to-day -day life. I'm not sure you watch these uh, killer robots on Netflix. Uh, not yet. <laughs> oh, okay. So to all the listeners, if you have not watched, please watch it. Mm. And that answers a very simple question, is AI here to stay? Right? Because one of the, the, the content inside is very interesting. They were taking the simulation data from all the fighter pilots, mm. train the AI, and they use a real fighter pilot to fight the, the AI itself. Initially, the AI didn't really trump, but over time, the AI was winning more than 99% of the time. So think about it, the war of the future doesn't even need a pilot to, to fight. You're going to deploy AI. It's going to be AI against AI. Uh, that's right, yeah. Some people are All saying right. that, yes, so exactly. If you look at it, downstream business application, mm. everything, it will be a lot of AI against AI. Mm -hmm. So personally, I think AI is here to stay. He has all the world in here, just that it's in the limelight and spotlight now, uh, oh, I and the adoption it will even be higher. Okay, so um, so in terms of um, the expectations then uh, when it comes to enterprises, uh, you know, using data centers, do you see that the current iteration of AI is going to result in an exponential, you know, in terms of expectations? I would say so, yes. Right, I believe okay. all the bots are asking, all the enterprises, the companies, mm -hmm. what are you doing about AI? How, how do you think are the use cases and what are the differentiation you can apply to the business? So I think all aspects in terms of, you know, how can you do things smarter, faster, more efficient, I think there's basic things that AI can easily resolve in many, many aspects of business. Okay, so, um, so when we talk about AI, right, staying on this kind of topic, right, um, and looking at the different types of data centers, so we, you know, um, before COVID, obviously, a lot of people have on-prem, right, <laughs> and then, we, then there's a shift of migration onto cloud, and now we are in the AI era and then moving on to Web3 and distributed storage, distributed processing, right, all this. And then, of course, in the background, there's also um, a lot of talks about high-performance computers, quantum computers. So when it comes to capital data centers, what are the kind of use cases that you are you know, using for your data center um, that is different from, say, you know, the quantum and the high-performance computers of this world? Well, I would say uh, every data center provider targets the slightly different segment. That's right. right? So. There are different segments of so-called data centers, but what Kappa is focused on uh, are really the wholesale co-location, we name it that way, to supply data center capacity to hyperscalers and big tech companies. Mm -hmm. So we go on wholesale provision on that. So what we focus on are really, you know, being able to understand each because their requirements are slightly different. That's across. right, yeah. So understanding what's the requirement and be able to have the engineering capability mm -hmm. to deliver the design at the cost, at a service level, and at the location and the requirement they need us to deliver for them. And speaking about location, and data, uh, Capo Data Center has different locations. So can you share with our listeners, our audience, 
what are the considerations that you know you take into account when you select locations for your to host your data center? Well, the number one question to answer is, uh, will any of my target customers want that location? Ah, right. right. I see. Right. That's okay, very okay. important. Right. And if that question is a yes, then the rest of the criteria has to come in. For example, oh, data center. One of the most important thing is power. Mm. Right. For the kind of data center I want to deliver, is it a cloud, is it an AI which is higher power density, do I have the sufficient power from the grid that I can draw from? Mm. So that's num the second question. And third, of course, water. Right? You need water to cool, mm. such high heat load. So will the supply of water you know, be there for me to, to be able to... And then I think, of course, very important is connectivity. Right. Well, do I do, am I near somewhere that I can tap into sufficient network backbones and infrastructure right, right, to connect the multi diverse path to my data? Okay, right. Okay, um, and then of uh, I think some are also starting to ask questions about what you, are you doing about sustainability, right? So can you talk <laughs> a little bit about you know some of the technologies that you are exploring? So there's multi aspects to it. I think the first step that to be a responsible data center is to drive efficiency. Right? Data center measures efficiency using a matrix called PUE. It stands for Power Usage Effectiveness. So it's always one point something. So the one, for example, 1.3 PUE means 0.3 of the power delivered to the data center is wasted. Wasted either by transmission losses or mostly cooling. Right? Too much to cool. So one is the theoretical limit of the most efficient. So first thing is to really drive a design and operation of a data center to be as low as PUE as possible. But second, my opinion, and everyone knows, even that one is a huge one, mm. big one. So when you draw that type of energy from a grid that has carbon emission, you are actually emitting carbon. So sustainability becomes the big question. How do we tackle the big one? So I believe data center needs to really look at how to partner with other industries in the renewable energy uh, okay. and energy transition industries to see how can we effectively tap on renewable energy right, to, so see. that we, do, uh, uh, we can deliver as green energy as possible for the data center to power up. And uh, at the same time, I believe this is where the location becomes very important. If you are then be able to source a location that somehow has new renewable power connection easily to your data center, then that's another plus point again. Yeah. And um, I want to come to a very important topic uh, for our cybersecurity audience, which is right, um, cybersecurity and data centers, right? Um, and of course, uh, data centers is kind of like the last line of defense when it comes to, for example, ransomware, you know, you have a backup in the data centers. Is there any sort of like, um, tips that you can give to our audience in terms of how you communicate allocation of cybersecurity budget uh, to align with mission critical goals? Because that's always a challenge for many cybersecurity professionals. It comes to a topic of trust that oh, your business okay. can deliver to your customers. Right? Right, Very I important. See. If you have a breach of trust, then how much is that worth? It's always the question. Right? It's not really throwing technology and investment in cybersecurity. Because if you build too much layers of security, it becomes dysfunctional, right? It defeats the purpose. So the right security posture becomes important. But then we also must think beyond cybersecurity, there's many aspects of trust. Data, so, you know, governance, data management, yes, yeah, everything that's right, that's that comes right. with it, right? Yeah. So how do we then build this trust? Uh, with our business ecosystem, basically a business with its business partner, with its customer, that is very, very important. So digital trust is something that uh, in SG Tech, that's why we work with the whole industry and realize it's much more than cyber. Cyber is a core piece of it, but it's the whole framework of, you know, from technology to people to governance, what do we do as a whole, including policies, including you know, company processes, and then even you know, up and coming technology and privacy enhancement, your data protection framework, and everything else that comes together as a holistic whole. I think this is why we need to pitch this. Uh, uh, every business needs to look into this. And even as economy as a whole, if we think digital is important for us, right, and we want digital services and data to hub here, then building the digital trust framework as a economy and industry as a whole is very, very important. Yeah, so you, you earlier touched on partnerships, right? Um, 
and and of course now you you touch about you touch on the human aspect, the people yeah. aspect, and I think um, for cybersecurity we have this uh, sort of a mantra that you know is about it's not just about technology, it's about people and process All as right. well, right? Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so I'm I'm aware that we are coming to the end of our podcast, but before we go, right, I must extend my congratulations to you as the tech leader year, uh, of the year award Thank you, of winning, winning that award um, so looking back at your you know your tech journey your career over the last um, three decades review my age <laughs> <laughs> 30, 30 right? plus okay yeah what is the sort of the big lesson that you can you know you learn from your tech journey career hmm. well tech industry has kept me very excited through my whole career uh, somehow keep going back to tech you know in my whole career and the most interesting about technology is it keeps changing right it is a constant evolution and sometimes uh, change can become revolutionary for other industries it disrupts industries it disrupts its own industry too it disrupts itself so I think that's the most exciting thing about tech industry right keeps me waking up every morning and hey something has changed again Right, yeah. So now with AI, of course, it's going to keep you up awake at night for longer. <laughs> right, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, Wai Ming, so thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's great to talk to you about, you know, to give our audience a glimpse into data centers and what to think about uh, when it comes to AI and how it's going to transform the data center landscape. So thank you so much thank for your you, time. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. having me. Thanks.